Um, this presentation is on uh, program development, a bit of a guide, a walkthrough, if you will, of uh, some important features to keep in mind um, as you're uh, developing a program before you even get to the stage of implementing it. Uh, just important steps to keep in mind. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a link here to download the slides. If you go to the um, GoToMeeting chat box, mm -hmm. the link is there as well. Um, so if you want a copy of those, feel free to uh, go to that link and download them. Um, now, before we get started, a quick disclaimer about program development and how it factors into uh, doctoral dissertations. I imagine that some of you um, are doctoral students. Um, in fact, if we could just take a quick informal poll, if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat box uh, what program uh, you are in and what uh, campus you attend, whether it's Chicago or online or LA, DC, um, any of the other campuses. Um, that would be helpful for me to understand, uh, you know, whether or not you are in fact working on a dissertation. Um, so for different programs, uh, there are different expectations, different requirements. So uh, make sure to establish with your committee, if you are in fact a, a doctoral student, um, what they expect because, uh, you know, based on my uh, background research on these topics, talking with different um, faculty in different departments, there are definitely, uh, there's definitely variability. So um, just note that I'll be going over, you know, most aspects, if not all of the program development. Um, and then uh, later this week, my colleague, Dr. Adu, will be talking about program evaluation. Um, so these uh, presentations are kind of, uh, they go hand in hand uh, and, they, and they definitely scaffold off of each other. Um, but for today's presentation, uh, here's what I'll be uh, discussing with you. Um, first of all, evidence-based decision-making and how that factors into uh, all of this. Um, it's a big requirement these days, so uh, I'll briefly touch on that. Um, then problem analysis and needs assessment, which is really kind of the first step or two steps um, in trying to understand how your program should uh, look and what needs it should be addressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then I'll talk about hypothesis development, and this is a little bit different than what uh, you know you typically see in like an empirical study, where you know you have uh, some kind of inferential statistics that you run comparing one group to another. It's a little bit different than that, um, but we'll we'll look into it. Um, and uh, then I want to present the logic model, which is. Uh, where a lot of um, program development and actually program evaluation uh, is really kind of centered. Um, and we'll be looking at all kinds of different technical uh, uh, information here about inputs and process, outputs and outcomes and impacts. Now that's a lot of technical terminology, but basically it boils down to how many resources are you uh, devoting to the program? That's the inputs. Um, what is the actual nature of uh, the program itself? That's the process. Um, so it's two sides of the same coin, right? Where you've got money and staff and resources going in, and then what is actually done with all those resources. Um, and then we've got outputs and outcomes, where outputs are sort of the, the, uh, the amounts of hours that are uh, devoted to programming. Um, and just kind of the uh, uh, you know the, the quantification, if you will, of uh, how many pieces of service are being provided, um, and then outcomes are again sort of another side of uh, that coin where it's the quality of life that uh, is impacted by all of that effort. Um, so again, two sides of the same coin, if you will, and then impact is kind of like the long term. Uh, uh, consequences of the program within the real world, within the community that you're working in. Um, and then finally, uh, I wanna talk about implementation monitoring. It's uh, uh, where you're looking at your program and making sure that it's being um, conducted the way you expected because there's a lot of 
um, potential problems where uh, if you have a wonderful theory about uh, you know what the problem is and how you're going to address it and uh, the uh, outputs and outcomes that you're expecting but if your program isn't being implemented according to what you uh, expect then the whole thing falls apart so we'll touch on that a little bit and um, uh, from there that's going to dovetail into uh, Dr. Adu's presentation on Thursday which will talk about uh, actual program evaluation where all of these things are going to be um, uh, well, evaluated after you implement the program. So I want you to think a little bit about the context here, right, where uh, you have to consider yourself the person developing the program and what are the pieces that you're going to have to put together? What are you going to have to take into account when you're planning your program, when you're, well, developing the program? Um, it's very tempting to think, you know, I'm just going to design an intervention and that's it. But there's a whole other uh, uh context within which that's uh, situated. So when we're talking about the intervention itself, that is literally just this piece right here, the process, and its associated outcomes, right? But you can see that there's a whole other uh, set of pieces that have to be considered. So uh, with that, let's start off with uh, evidence-based decision-making, the very first piece here. Um, in the real world, all of this really boils down to money. Um, there are funding agencies that are going to be uh, the the main um, source of being able to even develop a program and implement it. So the the current culture is that um, funding agencies want to know whether a program is going to be effective. They are looking for a return on investment, an ROI. You may have heard this term before. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, and uh, in terms of uh, ROIs, they are always looking at the, the best value. So, you know, they're going to be providing money, basically, those are the inputs, and they want to know what kinds of outputs they're getting. So the amount of services that they're getting for their money. Um, and they also want to know about uh, the services that are going to be provided, right, the process that you're going to be uh, developing, and the associated outcomes. So the services and then what kind of quality of life changes are those going to lead to? So when you're putting together a, a program, you have to have a plan that's going to demonstrate to basically an investor, here's what I'm going to be doing with your money. Uh, here's the amount of services that I'm expecting to provide. And here are the expected impacts on people's quality of life that, um, uh, that we're expecting. Um, and so you can look into all different kinds of funding agencies, whether it's the federal government, state governments, or private agencies, and they all have their own specific guidelines of uh, what is expected in terms of uh, reporting, in terms of, uh, again, what's called evidence-based uh, performance measurement. So you have to basically make sure that when you design a program, you are going to be able to track uh, its performance and then report that back to your um, funding agency, wherever they might be, whatever you know, public or private organization it might be. So within this context is where all of this comes into play. Because if all you wanna do is just design an intervention, that's great. If you're going into um, an organization that's already well-funded uh, and they have a budget for you, um, then that's, that's perfect, right? But you have to understand that this is the context within which your specific role is gonna be played. Um, so it's all about money, right? Money makes the world go round. Now, I don't want to harp on this, so let's just move on. Um, but there are these, uh, these great references here that, uh, that you can look up and, um, uh, and, and dig deeply into, um, you know, how this all works for each different, uh, program, uh, funding source. Okay. So when we're looking at effective programs, um, we have to think about a, a few different pieces. There's the need, um, which is something that exists out in the world, and uh, it's a you know you can think of it as a problem, right? There's a certain uh, aspect of uh, people's quality of life that may be not where it should be, um, or not where it's expected to be compared to other places in the world, um, and uh, what you also have to do is address the need. Right. First, you have to assess what the need is, then you have to address it. That's where program development really comes into play. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me. And then the last piece, of course, is measuring how effective the program was. And that's where program evaluation comes into play. Again, that's uh, Dr. Dew's presentation on Thursday. And uh, there's a great quote here. Um, you have to develop a program with evaluation in mind. Um, and, you know, I was speaking with Dr. Adu about this. He uh, uh, remembered this quote from somewhere. I'm just going to quote him. Um, and that's why I have the, the EG here, because there's a lot of different places where you might hear this. I heard it from him. But anyway, um, it's really from the very beginning important when you're starting to develop a program to already be thinking about evaluation. How am I going to keep track of uh, how I assess the need? How am I going to be keeping track of how I'm addressing the need. Um, and then that all feeds into later, you know, you're going to basically set everything up so that you can collect data and measure uh, how effective the program is. Um, and you'll notice I've got these two sort of pictures here, right? The idea is that you have to have uh, valid measurements of um, the, the need that you're addressing. So the example that I always harken back to is uh, you'll see here, this is a gym membership application. So you can think of it in terms of uh, if you collect data on gym memberships, is that a valid measure of, say, physical fitness? Let's say that the need you identify is that, um, you know, certain uh, parts of uh, the community are uh, lacking in physical fitness and you develop a program where you get them gym memberships that are, you know, funded by some uh, uh, philanthropy. And then you say, oh, well, look, my, my program is effective because I got, you know, 100 people to get gym memberships. And then you show up at the gym and it looks like this, right? Nobody's actually there. They just got the memberships, but they never actually went to the gym. So you have to know that the program you're developing is actually in line with your need and that you're actually addressing the need and that you're not missing anything. So that when you're measuring effectiveness, you're actually measuring it in a valid way. Um, and we're, we're going to look at a bunch of other examples, but at its very core, this idea of making sure that your program is uh, valid is going to be very important. So I just don't want to overlook that. I can't emphasize it enough. OK, so um, there's a couple of paradigms uh, when it comes to needs assessment, that first step. Um, and I want to make sure to uh, briefly touch on what's called the business as usual approach, um, because it's, it's really kind of like a, a a baseline from which we can do a lot better. Uh, so in the business as usual approach, you already have some existing services that are based on a traditional, maybe outdated understanding of a problem that exists out in the community. And uh, what ends up happening is that you see that there's an increasing need. And uh, the, the solution to that in the business as usual approach is that you just basically request increased funding to just build out the existing service. So you get, you know, you have more need. Well, let's just throw more money at the problem and just keep doing what we're doing. Um, and the issue there is if you have a program that's effective, you should be more or less trying to put yourself out of business where you're decreasing the need, that you're addressing the need so well that uh, over time, it's decreasing. If you're increasing the need and you're just throwing more money at the problem in the same way as before, you can expect the need to continue increasing and it's a kind of vicious cycle. Now, the alternative to this is this analytical approach where what you do is you conduct a problem analysis based on theory and research. So you come at it with fresh eyes um, and you basically look at uh, all kinds of different aspects of the problem, and we'll look into it in more detail in a minute. But basically, you come at it with a, a fresh perspective, um, which as program developers, you should always keep that in mind, that you should have, you know, try, try to keep as uh, objective a perspective as possible. You basically generate um, a current profile of those in need, um, as opposed to just assuming that the profile is the same over time, you know, as, as technology increases as uh, you know the world changes over time uh, people are going to change as well right and new generations are going to have new perspectives on uh, you know what kinds of programs they're going to want to access and so you want to have a current profile of the people who have a specific need and then from there 
you develop a novel approach. You don't just ask for more money to continue doing what's been done. You look at developing a novel approach to providing services based on that up-to-date understanding of the problem. So under this analytical, uh, excuse me, analytical approach is where uh, we're really going to focus the rest of the presentation, um, because a problem analysis is uh, really the first step towards um, developing a meaningful, impactful, valid program. So uh, let's take a look at that. Um, there's you see the, the the heading here says needs assessment colon problem analysis because problem analysis and needs assessment kind of go hand in hand and so there are other aspects of needs analysis but problem analysis is a major kind of you know subheading of uh, needs assessment um, and I want to couch all of this in saying that problem analysis is more of an art than a science so there's a number of different points that we're going to look at in a minute, um, and they all kind of bleed into each other. Uh, and you have to kind of use each one of them in a way that is most appropriate to the program that you're developing. There's no kind of, you know, silver bullet where you can say, okay, it's these nine steps, but not these two steps and so on and so forth. It's going to be kind of a, uh, a mashup of what's most uh, conducive to your particular program that you're developing. So first of all, what's the nature of the situation or the condition? Um, if we're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, if we're looking at uh, different types of um, uh, problems that exist out in the world, you have to again look at it with fresh eyes and and get a, a, a good idea of what's actually going on out in the world. Um, the second point is, how are the terms being operationalized? Well, this means if you are going out in the world and looking at the, the problem that um, you're interested in, you have to build a common vocabulary with different stakeholders. So you're going to have managers, you're going to have service providers, you're going to have um, actual uh, you know, mental health workers, you're going to have um, clients, you know, the people who are actually receiving the services. All these different people are going to be using different terms, and you want to make sure that if you hear a different term from one person, uh, you understand that it might be the same exact thing as some other term that somebody else is using. So you have to make sure that you understand the, uh, the language of the different stakeholders and um, try to build consensus that you're all talking about the same thing. Um, what are the characteristics of those experiencing the condition? Well, this is a very important one because you need to know uh, whether there's some kind of specific subgroup of the community who is most affected by uh, the situation or condition from step one. So if uh, we're looking at, for example, um, domestic violence, uh, it might be that you're looking at lower socioeconomic status women uh, who have kids and um, that is a specific you know, set of characteristics, a certain set of um, uh, demographics that are going to be very important for you uh, as you go to build out the program because you're going to be recruiting a, a specific type of person. You know, if you're looking at a, uh, a domestic violence um, support program um, or a skills training program for uh, victims of domestic abuse, you know, you're not going to be recruiting, um, for example, uh, single people who have never been uh, victims of domestic violence, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So you need to know who you're going to be um, uh, recruiting. Well, not, not recruiting, but who you're going to be serving, right? Um, okay, so uh, the next point is uh, you have to understand what the scale and distribution of the condition is. You know, so uh, where is the uh, condition most prevalent? Maybe there's a part of town that is most affected. Um, maybe there is uh, a known uh, number of people who are affected. Um, you know how uh, how are they distributed? Not only across the uh, the geography of the um, of the community, but also the density within certain parts of town can help you understand where to, for example, set up a center. Um, the next point is about social values and uh, what social values are being threatened 
by the existence of the condition. This is a, really about the community. Um, so, for example, if you uh, if you open the community's eyes, if you uh, start to make people understand that there is a certain condition that's sort of not seen typically by your typical community member, um, it might turn out that you can get a backlash or it might turn out that you get more support. Uh, if, if all of a sudden, you know, people start to find out that, oh my gosh, there is like an endemic domestic violence problem in the community, then that can disrupt the community, right? So if you understand that, then you can start to address those problems and it really can have uh, implications for how well your program is received, how politically charged it becomes. And all of these things are part of, uh, you know, again, the real world context of how uh, programs are developed. So it's important to know that you might be um, sort of ruffling feathers, if you will, out in the community by uh, by opening up, uh, you know, the um, the perception of of this condition really being, you know, part of the community, whereas people otherwise might not have known. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of sort of political considerations, right? Um, and this the second point, uh, the sixth point, I should say, uh, is related to the fifth. Um, Again, without mass awareness, without buy-in from the community, um, there might not be acceptance, uh, there might not be action regarding the condition. So, um, you know, you need to understand how widely it's recognized. <clears throat> and of course, this again feeds into the political will to devote resources to address the problem. If nobody knows about it, including the decision makers in city hall or the state capital or the federal level, wherever the program might be uh, situated, um, then it's not going to get any traction. Okay, uh, the next point is about defining the condition as a problem. And what this really ties into is um, just because there's a certain condition out in the world doesn't necessarily dictate that it's a problem. So as a, a, a program developer, um, you have to go from demonstrating that there is a certain um, set of circumstances which is kind of like an evaluation uh, free way of stating a condition and then turning it into uh, uh, a problem. So if you were to say, for example, that um, you know, there's a certain subset of the population that earns less than $15,000 per year and uh, has uh, children and has been uh, involved in uh, interactions with the police, that's a condition. But if you then demonstrate that that's a problem, then you can start to put it in context. We're talking about victims of domestic violence. And that has implications for um, psychological well being, for uh, the ability to uh, uh, get resources, for um, uh, you know, child support and, and child welfare. And I don't mean in terms of like government spending programs. I mean like you know the well-being of your children, um, and and so on and so forth. So you can demonstrate that yes, there are these certain known conditions. We know the demographics, we know the numbers, but then how is that a problem? Um, <clears throat> this next one is very important: the etiology of the problem. That means what are the causes of it? Where does it come from? How does it come about? Um, and when you know this, then you know how you can address those causes. So we'll talk a lot about this actually uh, later in the presentation when we talk about hypothesis development, because if you can nail down the causes, then when you develop your program, you're gonna be uh, basically trying to uh, make those causes go away, so to speak. And <clears throat> by making the causes go away, then the adverse uh, effects are also hypothesized to go away. And then finally, um, this last point is really emerging more recently. Are there ethnic and gender considerations? So these are two very important uh, demographic variables um, that you have to consider. And it, of course, ties into uh, number three, right? What are the characteristics of those experiencing the condition? But specifically, ethnic and gender considerations uh, are going to be uh, playing a major role. And you know, if you look at the example of a domestic violence uh, victim support program, um, we're probably going to be talking about women, right? They're typically the, the victims of uh, domestic violence, even though there is 
uh, evidence that says that men are also victims of domestic violence, um, you know, more likely than not, you're going to be uh, uh, working with women. So um, you can obviously tailor your program um, to be more sensitive to the needs of that particular uh, sub population from the community. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I want to pause here for a second, see if there are questions, and also emphasize that if you have questions anywhere at any point, um, you can either type them in the chat box or um, uh, unmute yourself in the uh, go to meeting and uh, you know I, I am happy to clarify uh, any kinds of uh, questions you might have. But if not, I will just keep on going. Okay, um, so needs assessment, right? I said, uh, right, we were looking before, the problem analysis is one. Uh, we can also look at the different types of needs that have been uh, uh, developed in terms of you know, the history of program development. Um, and they boil down to three or four, depending on how you look at it, types of need. There's the normative slash relative need, there's express need, and there's perceived need. Um, so again, think of yourself as a program developer, and as I go through each of these, think, you know, what am I going to have to consider as a program developer? Um, because none of these are mutually exclusive. They all kind of uh, can work together. Some are more useful than others, depending on what kind of program you're developing, and so on. So let's just go through them, and hopefully you'll see things that will, that will click for you in terms of uh, which of these strategies you can use. So first of all, normative need. Normative need is where you're uh, looking at the community that you're assessing um, versus some established standard, meaning a norm, right? That's, that's where you get this term, normative need. Well, you know, how does your community look compared to some norm? And these norms uh, can be provided from, for example, national statistics, uh, like the Census Bureau. There are a lot of... Uh, reports that the Census Bureau puts out. There are data sets that are freely available um, that you can analyze and look at national trends, regional trends, state by state trends, um, even city by city in some cases, depending on the, the specific uh, uh, data set that's available. Uh, you can also uh, gather professional opinions about what um, expected norms should be. <coughs> So for example, uh, Chicago School faculty who work with different communities. Um, there are also uh, consultants who work on all kinds of different programs that are developed around the country, around the world. Um, any kind of expert who would be uh, recognized by um, uh, the professional community uh, would be a good resource. And again, it depends on what kind of program you're developing to determine who would be the best uh, person or persons to speak with. Um, and what, what this kind of uh, normative need uh, assessment allows you to do is generate objective targets for services. So um, if you know <clears throat> that there's a certain level that you should be getting your community to, then that's a target that you can shoot for. So for example, a staff to client ratio that matches comparable programs from around the country. Um, so if you know that there's like a one to five staff to client ratio, that's your target. That's your norm that you can um, implement for your program so that your community is on par with other communities and other programs. Um, the next type of need, which is related, is relative need. Um, so the standard or norm that I talked about on the last slide can often be defined as a comparable community. Um, and so you can look at your community that you're assessing versus a comparable community, a comparable geographic area, or a comparable demographic area. So if you're looking at um, a, uh, a problem that affects, let's just go with that domestic violence example, women who are below the poverty line, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're all concentrated in the geographic area. Every city in America is going to have uh, some women who are, uh, you know, living uh, at or below the poverty line, right? So um, 
when you look at uh, this kind of analysis, you can think of it in those terms where you can find that comparable group you know, in any, any kind of sort of physical or geographic or demographic uh, level of analysis and say, okay, well, where are these communities that I can kind of compare mine to? And um, again, it ties into this, uh, uh, this notion of normative need. Okay, um, express need. Express need is where you look at people who have actually in the past already expressed their desire for a service. So uh, that's what service statistics are. Who received what from whom and at what cost? Uh, so the who, break down the demographics of what's already known about who's seeking a particular type of service. Obviously the service that we're talking about is something that is related to your program that you want to develop. All feeds into the, pro, uh, the, um, the needs assessment. Um, what services are provided and how many units? And the unit, again, depends on uh, uh, the program. So it might be an hour of therapy. It could be, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, a training exercise. It could be a um, role playing, a uh, unit of role playing uh, that's done by some outside expert who comes in. It could be, you know, art therapy. It could be anything. Um, but that's what amounts means is, you know, how many units of service are being provided and what kind of service is it? So it's both qualitative and quantitative. And from whom? Uh, so again, are we talking about therapists? Are we talking about uh, doctors? Are we talking about staff of some sort? Um, and not only that, but what are their caseloads? Again, what is the ratio of providers to clients? Um, and finally, at what cost? So uh, again, how much is being spent on all of this? And, and there are all kinds of ratios that you can calculate with this. So if you, you can, for example, say um, dollars spent per client, dollars spent per unit of service, um, it all depends, again, on your funding agency and what kind of uh, reporting they want. Um, so you can obviously track down those guidelines, and you're always going to have um, uh, someone who's working at the funding agency who's going to be a good sounding board for these kinds of uh, uh, pieces of information. Um, okay, so finally, the, the take home point here uh, is that these kinds of service statistics, they paint a picture of what is actually in demand. So what are people looking for? What are they expressing in terms of what's already being done? Um, and you'll Remember that this might be bleeding into that idea of uh, business as usual. Um, but again, if you're keeping an objective mind, if you're keeping an open mind as you're developing your program, you can start to understand what is and isn't working. So if you're seeing that people are uh, reporting that they are trying to get a certain service, but they can't get it and are being um, sort of funneled into some other service that is existing, well, then you know that there's something else that you can do because they're saying, no, I want this, but I keep getting this, right? So um, that's always useful information. Um, okay, so that's express need, basically people's behavior in terms of seeking out uh, services. Um, all right, okay, and yeah, I've got some examples here, right? So uh, uh, access that people have, I just talked about that, right? What is uh, What do they have access to versus what they might want? underutilization if there's a service that's being provided but people don't really want it then you know that that business as usual approach isn't working so it's kind of like the flip side where you know the supply and demand is out of balance um the the capacity of a program how much services are able to be provided um and of course the inadequacy or lack of clarity in desired outcomes so if people have a certain uh uh, understanding of what they want, but you as a program developer know that there are ways to provide that that are more efficient or that are more effective and so on, then um, you can start to uh, make sense of what needs to be done. People don't know what they don't know, right? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, okay, so a couple of examples of these uh, pertinent statistics. And again, what is pertinent depends on the unique features of each needs assessment and each program that is being developed. But just a few examples. Um, mental health statistics can be useful, crime statistics, uh, marriage and divorce rates, religious or spiritual beliefs and practices. All of these things will factor into um, how people are going to uh, express their needs. Because if you have uh, some folks who are affected by crime, then they're going to be looking for different kinds of services. Um, and your program might have to adapt to that, for example, right? So um, anyway, just a few uh, examples here. Um, but I want to move on to the next type of need, um, which is perceived need. And again, it, it sort of uh, overlaps with uh, express need, but perceived need isn't really about people's behavior, what they've already sought out before. It's really more like what they think that they want. Um, and in order to assess this, uh, you know, you can't assume that people don't really know what they want. I mean, a lot of the time it's very clear to potential um, recipients of services what they need. Um, because they live in their world, right? They know that there are certain things that they need, but they aren't getting. So you can survey them to assess their perceived needs. Um, so again, potential consumers of uh, uh, services, um, existing service providers um, who might not be getting the support they need to provide services, and of course, management um, who are kind of like the fil information filters who, you know, they, they hear from their service providers. They hear from their consumers and they, they uh, can start to make sense of all the different information coming, like sort of filtering up to their, uh, their level of, uh, of the pyramid, if you will. Um, you can hold public forums or hearings um, or also convene expert panels. Um, and as far as these go, uh, there are a couple of formal techniques um, which are called the nominal group technique and the Delphi technique. Uh, there's a great study that um, outlines these, uh, Delbeck, Van de Ven, and Gustafson from 1975. Uh, basically what it is is you get people to, um, you know, you convene a panel of experts and you have them um, uh, come up with their own uh, ideas about what needs to be done. And then they do it on their own, right? They don't share, they don't talk, they just develop their own ideas. And then you, as the sort of facilitator um, or the moderator, whatever you want to call it, of the panel, uh, you consolidate all these things, you remove redundancies, and then you find out like what are the shared ideas among all these folks. And then you have them kind of compare and contrast the pros and cons of each of these main ideas that emerged. So, you know, very fancy terms, but really the process is uh, um, more or less. Uh, just a group effort, if you will. Um, just generating ideas. Uh, we've all been in these meetings, right, where somebody jots down ideas on one of those big pieces of paper, um, and then you kind of talk about all of it. So that's that's kind of what it boils down to. Um, okay, so as far as needs assessment, the, we've talked about these different types of needs. Um, and as I mentioned, no one method is best. They're not mutually exclusive. All these different things are going to kind of uh, uh, be um, more or less useful depending on the program that you're developing. Um, and of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be these uh, operational definitions of constructs, meaning that you have uh, different people talking about the same things in different ways. So when you're going into to be a program developer, you have to understand that context. You have to understand the way that people are talking about problems and put everything together to start to generate the themes that are going to be part of your program. So you have to understand your client base, basically. Um, might be a no-brainer, but you know that's kind of the bottom line. Um, okay, so these are some specific takeaways. Now, more generally, I think I mentioned this, that needs assessment is more of an art than a science. And that's just not me talking. There's this great book, and I, I, I reference this book a lot because I found it very useful. Um, Kettner et al. 2013 very um, lays it out very nicely. Um, and right, the bottom line is determine the resources that are available uh, and the constraints 
that you're working within and decide which of these methods are feasible. And so I've got this little Venn diagram, right? You've got four different methods of needs assessment um, and you're gonna be somewhere within this Venn diagram in terms of what's gonna be the most useful for you. So once you assess the need, then you can start to uh, build your program hypothesis. So from the needs assessment, um, you can then understand the conditions that are associated with the root cause of the need, and the conditions are also typically associated with the problematic outcome. So what, what ends up happening is you've got a root cause, and it leads to problematic effects, right? So if we're going with this domestic violence example, the root cause is domestic violence, right? Um, and it has problematic effects, obviously. Um, but in reality, domestic violence has some intervening variables that then lead to problematic effects. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples in a minute, but basically we have to understand is there are certain things that you can address and certain things that you can't. Um, and you have to not pick your battles, but you have to know where to intervene. Okay, so, uh, right. When you look at um, the needs assessment and how it feeds into these conditions, uh, here's those examples that I wanted to mention. Um, if your program is focused on uh, helping people in poverty, well, you're not gonna change capitalism, right? That's not a battle that is uh, feasible. Um, so what you have to do is change the intervening variable, change people's employability to decrease poverty, right? That might be, the intervening variable that you actually can address is that if you have folks who are not employable, who are in poverty, well, maybe the program should focus on job skills, right? Work within uh, the context of the real world to make a, a positive impact. You might not be able to cure disability, but you can change parents' coping skills to decrease child abuse, right? And again, so the example we're going with domestic violence, you can't prevent violence in our society. So change domestic, uh, domestic violence abuse victims, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> domestic abuse victims' ability to become independent of their abusers. Um, research shows that a lot of uh, domestic violence and domestic abuse, using those interchangeably actually, uh, is um, perpetuated because uh, the victims are dependent on uh, the perpetrators. Um, so, you know, if, if you understand that, then you can design a program that helps them be independent and not be victims, uh, even though you might not be able to prevent violence on a, you know, societal level. So these kinds of uh, conditions that feed both into the root cause and the negative effect, we can call those causes and address those, right? So if we can address those causes, then we should see a change in the effects. And guess what? That's a program hypothesis. If we can address cause X, then we should see a change in effect Y. So let's look at an example. Um, let's say that your needs assessment and you conduct a literature review, they indicate that domestic violence victims have low self-esteem and high anxiety. They're socially isolated from friends, family, and the community, and they lack job or career skills and therefore money for you know, basic needs. Well, if we offer a program that addresses these causes, then domestic violence victims will have increased self-esteem and reduced anxiety. They'll secure housing and childcare in the community and you know, build their social network and will be employed with adequate income. And so these intervening variables will have an effect on uh, the outcome or you know, the, uh, uh, the effect. So uh, this is really starting to get into the nuts and bolts of how a program is gonna be developed because once you start to see that these are the intervening variables, then guess what? You can design services to, uh, to address these intervening variables and then hope that the effect is as expected when you're doing program evaluation. Okay. So uh, that's what the logic model is. This is where the logic model, which I, again, again, I mentioned it's, it's sort of central 
to all of this. Uh, it really comes into play here. So you've got inputs, process, outputs, outcomes, and impact. And each of these uh, is part of the program that you're going to develop. So I want to talk about each of them in turn. Um, and I already talked about them a little bit, so I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, but basically, you're putting resources into activities that have, uh, you know, th there's a certain amount of those activities that have a certain demonstrated benefit in terms of changing quality of life that then has a long-term effect in the community. So let's talk about them in turn. Uh, inputs. Again, this is resources. This is staff time. This is money. This is materials. This is uh, all the sort of uh, uh, logistical support that you need to actually make a program function. Uh, you know, if you have a car, you need to put gas in it, right? So this is the gas that you uh, that you have to put in. Um, one major problem with uh, inputs is that all boils down to money, right? And uh, there's this really great quote again from that Kettner book that I uh, uh, that I am so fond of, um, that budgeting decisions are still heavily influenced by incremental and political considerations. Uh, and what incremental and pol uh, political considerations are is basically saying, look, if you have a program, um, you're only going to get a little bit more or a little less money depending on how much money you used last year. So if you show that you need more money, we'll give you a little bit more money. If you're not using all your money, we're going to give you a little less money. Um, political considerations are where you have lobbies, you have stakeholders who are pressuring budgetary changes. And the problem is that those who are the most in need have the least political power. So those victims of domestic violence, the homeless, children, the mentally ill, all of these people are going to have less political power. And so they're going to have less influence over the budget. Um, so it's unfortunate, but all of these inputs that we're talking about are seldom considered by decision makers, except when they happen to coincide with their own preconceived ideas. So it's not that decisions about money are made based on you know, a valid assessment of need and things like this, but a lot of the time it happens incrementally and politically. So you have to be aware of this. Okay, I'm gonna get off the soapbox now, but it, this is a very important point. So you can't ignore it when you're uh, in the, the milieu of um, developing a program and working within a program and evaluating a program. So, okay, those are inputs. You need the money, you need the time, you need the budget. The process. This is where you know the actual magic happens, right? This is where um, you have to survey the literature about the effectiveness of approaches for dealing with a particular clinical topic. You have to design your intervention and you have to conduct a pilot test, right, to make sure that it all kind of works. Um, and then based on the, the results of that pilot, then you revise the program uh, and scale it up into a full-fledged program. Um, now, there's a lot of different programs that you could put together. Well, not pro the, the program is the whole thing. There's a lot of different processes that you could uh, put together. And it's important to know that there are a lot of technical terms that people are already using and there's a common vocabulary that you can kind of um, uh, join and, and start to be more efficient in terms of you know, surveying literature and finding effective approaches instead of starting from scratch because maybe you didn't search for the right keyword, right? Um, and uh, the Arizona Department of Economic Security actually uh, puts together this, this dictionary. It's like a taxonomy, right? So um, I just want to show you this very quickly. I think I have it open, yeah. So um, it's this taxonomy of human services, and they basically have uh, an alphabetical listing of programs and clusters. So you can literally look at, from A to Z, all the different types of uh, uh, programs that are out there and see what kind of terminology you can use when developing yours. You know, I keep coming back to this idea that uh, you have to talk to stakeholders <coughs> and develop a shared vocabulary, right? So that's what this is all about. And this taxonomy is <clears throat> a great resource for that. Excuse me. OK. Um, let's go back. Whoopsie. Oh, no. What did I just do?
sorry about that. I don't know what just happened. Um, okay. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, we're back. Um, right. So this uh, 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 this Arizona um, Department of Economic Security uh, taxonomy is very useful. Um, okay, so that's process, right? And this is where we're really focused as practitioners, as professional uh, psychologists. This is where you're focused. But again, this is only one part of the puzzle, and the other part of uh, it all is outputs. So you see, I've got a picture here of somebody counting beans. You may have heard of uh, bean counting before. Uh, and what it boils down to is the quantity of service. Remember, I talked about this, right? The, um, the funding agency wants to know that they're getting a return on their investment. So they want to know how many hours of service, how many number, of, what number of people have completed the program. All these different things are going to be important. So you have to make sure that when you're developing your program, you have a mechanism for uh, keeping track of all this. Um, and there are two different kinds of outputs. There are intermediate outputs and final outputs. Intermediate outputs are, again, the amount of output per unit of time spent. Um, <clears throat> and you can have uh, monthly reports. Uh, you also have to have um, you know, a mechanism for identifying who is responsible for putting together such reports so that you can keep an eye on your program. Um, and monitoring is another part of it, where you have to make sure that your program is running as expected. If all of a sudden it turns out that the number of hours last month was half of what it was the month before, well, what the heck is going on, right? So you have to keep track of all this. Um, and then final outcomes are completion status. So not just what's going on month to month, but you know how many clients have completed the program this year, for example. Um, and then finally, um, all these quantitative aspects, you have to be very careful because it, it becomes tempting to, uh, from this perspective, be able to put together a report for the, um, the funding agency and said, look, we had 1,000 hours of, of services last month. Okay, well, that's great, but you know, did you really have 1,000 quality hours? Um, it could be very tempting to squeeze in more and more service units but each of those units would be worth less and less in terms of uh, outcomes for the client, right? That's the difference between outputs and outcomes. The output is, yes, I did something. But the outcome is, how does the client benefit? Are they getting an improvement in quality of life? And um, that's the key, right? Um, the changes in quality of life achieved by clients between entry into and exit from a program. Very important. So you can quantify this. Um, you can use standardized instruments. If we're looking at depression, for example, uh, you could use the Beck Depression Inventory and say, OK, well, you give everybody the Beck Depression Inventory at intake and then at completion. And of course, you can have statistical analyses that go with this. So um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with uh, T-scores, but basically, if you score above a certain level, then you can be level, labeled as severely depressed or within a certain range, you could be labeled moderately depressed or not depressed and so on. Um, but certainly if 90% you know, of your clients are severely depressed at intake and not depressed <clears throat> at, at exit, that's a, that's a good outcome. Um, and you can also set targets. Uh, that's the second point here. So you can set a target of you know, X percent of clients will achieve a certain outcome. Oh, this should say outcome, not output, sorry. Um, as evidenced by, and then some predefined measurement. Maybe it's the BDI, maybe it's um, you know, uh, graduation from a program, uh, so on. It, again, depends, <clears throat> depends on your specific program that you're developing. Uh, and this is how you can test your hypotheses, right? This isn't necessarily um, like a traditional hypothesis test, like, you know, you say, oh, well, uh, between pre and post, there's going to be a significant uh, increase in or a significant decrease in uh, anxiety, right? We're talking about individual level analyses that you can then summarize. And oftentimes, sure, you could have a cohort that comes in, they all get the BDI, and then at, uh, at exit, they all get the BDI again, and you say, okay, well, 
you know, is there a statistically significant difference from pre to post? But, you know, that's, that's only in some cases. You're not always going to have that kind of analysis, like with a traditional, like, empirical study, right? Um, you also have qualitative data. You can interview clients uh, at different points along uh, the process. You can do focus groups at different points. You can uh, analyze documents that are generated over the course of the program. Um, and again, it depends on how you want to do it, but you can certainly do uh, intake interviews and exit interviews. You could do interviews somewhere, you know, over the course of the program. Depends on your resources. Depends on uh, what information you actually need to get. A lot of the time, it's better to focus on quantitative. A lot of other times, it's better to focus on qualitative. It depends on how many people you have in the program. It depends how many resources you have to be able to conduct data analysis. Again, it all depends. Um, but you know, luckily, as far as uh, you know, shameless plug here, uh, you have methodology experts who can help you determine what the best uh, methods are here. Um, and there's also mixed methods, which is where you combine these two quantitative and qualitative data analyses. Um, but anyway, um, don't want to dwell too much on that. The point being that you want to know how your clients are actually doing. OK, and I mentioned this, program implementation monitoring. Uh, this is where you have uh, this notion of, is the program working as designed? Are things actually being implemented as I design them? Um, so it could very well turn out that your clients are not uh, getting a benefit. <laughs> and it could be that the program is ineffective because you designed a program that doesn't help. Or it could be that you designed an excellent program using really good theory, really good needs assessments, really good literature, but it was just implemented, uh, implemented incorrectly. And you have to be able to exclude that possibility that it's been implemented incorrectly. So, you know, you could have, a, again, a great theory with poor implementation. That means that the program failed. It leads to a lack of positive change for the clients, right? You could have a bad theory with great implementation. That means that your theory failed. The effect is the same, right? Lack of positive change. So in both of these scenarios, you have the same outcome, a lack of change, but for different reasons. And you obviously want to have, you know, A, a great theory, but B, great implementation. And that's a true test of the theory and the program. So that's what program implementation monitoring is, is that you're making sure, okay, yes, we're doing X number of uh, uh, trainings per client per week. Yes, people are showing up, the clients are showing up for their therapies. Um, you know, so you're basically making sure that they're uh, doing things as expected. And if not, then you are also using this information to manage the program. Right, so that's what this last point here is, is that you need to make sure that your program, if it's not running smoothly, that you are writing uh, the things that are going wrong. Um, so you have to have a plan, right? You have to have a plan for monitoring the activities of program staff. Again, consistency of implementation and uh, that the clients are actually from the population predicted to benefit. So if we're looking at domestic violence victims, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're serving that uh, demographic that you designed the program for. If you have a victim of domestic violence who uh, is uh, living in poverty, the program is geared towards that person. If you have a victim of domestic violence who uh, comes from a household that makes you know ten million dollars a year, certainly possible, right? Um, you know, I saw uh, uh, what was that show called? Um, oh gosh, I forget. My wife made me watch it, but um, anyway, it was uh, that show on HBO where they had uh, that couple where they were, you know, an abusive relationship. Wish I could remember the name of it. Anyway, um, but it's a it's a whole different set of uh, issues that a different program would address, right? Somebody from those two disparate ends of the socioeconomic spectrum would have different programs that would benefit them. And so, if a client is not getting a benefit, it might be because um, it's not geared towards them. So you have to make sure of that. And again, um, you want to be able to manage your uh, uh, 
your program effectively. So implementation monitoring is very important on all those fronts. Okay, finally, impact. So regardless of the outputs and the outcomes, they're all related, but the impact is a long-term consequence in the community at large. So in our domestic violence example, you could have, uh, uh, for example, police data that you can analyze and see whether there's a reduced number of reports of domestic violence in the community, in the program service area, as I'm calling it here. And that can be uh, a very positive result to report back to the uh, funding agency, right? Um, if you're having this kind of impact, that's amazing. Um, of course, you have to infer that it's a function of the program and not a function of something else, but that's a story for a different day. The, the, the kinds of causality that we can infer really depends on uh, uh, what you can compare um, this kind of result to. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that offline. We don't have time right now. We're actually a minute over, um, but this is the last slide. So um, I just want to mention that as far as impact goes, there may be unintended consequences. You could see a backlash from domestic violence perpetrators. Um, and I've worked with students who, who wrote dissertations showing that um, with domestic violence, there is uh, a, uh, a certain type of um, victim who will uh, be afraid to get help because of fear of backlash. So if you have a program where um, you convince victims of domestic violence to come and get help, and then they never come back, well, is it because you help them? Or is it because uh, they, they have been victimized again, and now they're afraid to get help again? So these impacts can be positive or they can be negative. And it's important to understand that it could it could cut both ways. Um, okay, so I want to leave you with a couple of examples. Uh, uh, again, if you download the slides, these are all in here. But um, I have to thank uh, Dr. Terry Webster, um, who uh, provided these. Uh, these are three dissertations um, of program development uh, and or evaluation, actually, uh, that um, are seen as you know very uh, good templates or examples that you can use. If you read these, then you can definitely um, uh, use them as uh, points of reference that you can, uh, you know, get more of a, you know, complete example as opposed to these uh, slides or classes that you're taking. Reading a dissertation will really give you a, a well-rounded idea of how this all works. So. Um, all of them are available on ProQuest, right? So uh, you can go to the library website and uh, download the full text of them. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you have questions, um, I have a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll stick around. Um, and if not, then you can uh, email me. Uh, if you're at the LA campus, I'm in room 748, and there's my phone number down here as well. Uh, and also, I'm going to post this presentation on our YouTube channel. If you just go on YouTube and type in NCADE, uh, we're the first hit that shows up. And um, you'll see this uh, as one of the presentations on there.